the Honourable the Prime Minister. <coughs> Thank you, Mr Speaker. As a matter of courtesy, I inform the House of the Minister for Land Transport and uh, Shipping Support, the Honourable Bob Brown, will be absent from question time today, attending the Australian Transport Advisory Council meeting. Questions uh, for Mr Brown should be directed to the Minister for Transport and Communications, Mr Willis. I also inform the House that the Minister for Telecommunications and Aviation Support, Mrs Kelly, is on leave. The Minister for Science, Customs and Small Business, Mr Jones, is overseas on government business. Questions normally directed to Mrs Kelly should also go to Mr Willis and questions for Mr Jones should go to Mr Kerrin. Questions without notice. Are there any questions? The Honourable Member for Gippsland. My question without notice is directed to the Prime Minister. Is the Prime Minister aware of the open conflict between Senator Button and the Minister for Science over the effect of funding cuts to CSIRO's capacity? Further, is the Minister aware of a letter dated 20th of November 1989 from the Minister for Science to Mr Ben Bremner, policy consultant to Senator Button, regarding the CSIRO's submission to the Australian Science and Technology Council on Environmental Science, from which I quote, if you want to give directions about how CSIRO's material is presented, I suggest that you start with me. I don't quite understand what you think is to be gained by lying about the organisation's capacity. This is a Mr. Order. The Mr. Speaker. Uh, question. This is from uh, the Minister for Science. To continue, um, I don't quite understand what you think is to be gained by lying about the organisation's capacity. I don't appreciate you throwing your weight around the CSIRO offices. If I thought you had something to contribute, that would be another matter. End of quote. What steps will the Prime Minister take to resolve this conflict between his two ministers? The Honourable the Prime Minister. The answer to the first question is no. The answer to the second question is no. The Honourable Member for, the Honourable Member for Gippsland on a point of order. I seek leave to table the letter whereby one minister accuses the senior order. staff in another minister's office of lying. Order. The Member for Gippsland will resume his seat. Is leave granted? Leave isn't granted. The Honourable Member for Isaacs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. Order. And as the Prime Minister be aware, there have been a number of demonstrations in Romania in recent times, and of the violent suppression of those demonstrations in Romania. What is the government's response to uh, the situation in Romania at the present time? The Honourable the Prime Minister. <clears throat> Uh, Mr Speaker, I thank the honourable uh, member for his question. The latest information available uh, to the government suggests that hundreds and perhaps thousands of Romanians were killed at the weekend following the violent suppression of demonstrations in Timisoara. The regime's tanks on Monday mowed down a group uh, protesting in Timisoara against the government's refusal to allow them to bury those killed earlier. According to reports, tanks ploughed through the demonstrators rolling over the living and the dead and splashing their blood on nearby buildings. As a result of this horror, between 50 and 100,000 people took to the town streets again yesterday. Further demonstrations have since taken place throughout the country and have spread beyond uh, ethnic Hungarian areas. In the past few hours, troops have been uh, pulled out of Timisoara, but major cities remain encircled by tanks. Ceausescu has blamed recent events on, quote, international terrorism and remains unrepentant, so the danger of further brutality and more deaths remains. Mr Speaker, what we are witnessing in Romania is ageing rulers trying to protect an outdated and undemocratic system by turning their tanks upon their own people. The bloody suppression of dissent and the slaughter of demonstrators may work for a time. Mr Speaker, 1989's great lesson to the world has been that repression in the end cannot prevail against the innate and simple human desire to live a decent life in freedom. That is why the dissidents in Romania will finally win, and it is why those who have murdered their own people will find no peace. Australians join all the civilised world in condemning these atrocities. We have protested in the strongest terms to the Romanian authorities. We are consulting our friends in both East and West Europe and elsewhere to examine what other options might be available to register our outrage at these events. We are continuing to monitor events in Romania very closely. 
Mr Speaker, may I say in conclusion that I'm sure all members of this House and all Australians will join me in offering our profound sympathy to the relatives of those Romanians who have died as a result of their peaceful protests against a tyrannical regime and our admiration for those who are continuing to struggle. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Not a question, uh, Mr Speaker. With your indulgence in 10 seconds, I simply wish to associate the Opposition with the remarks of the Prime Minister, uh, remarks with which we would totally concur. The people of Romania have had to endure too much for too long, and the swirling winds of change that are now occurring uh, will bring about the sorts of change which have unravelled elsewhere. The Honourable Member for O'Connor. Thank you. Um, <coughs> thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is addressed to the Minister for Employment, Education and Training, and, and the question relates to the administration of the higher education administrative charge. And I ask, is it a fact that absolutely no refunds of this charge are paid by universities unless the student concerned formally withdraws from the course prior to the commencement of the first term? Is it also a fact that the 1988 term at Murdoch University commenced on the 22nd of February, but, the, but that formal withdrawal by a student on the 3rd of March was approved for refund of $236 by the process of backdating the application to the 21st of February? Is it also a fact that this student is the minister's wife, Maggie Dawkins, and if so, what influence did the minister exert to cause the university to provide this preferential treatment? The Honourable the Minister. I have uh, no idea of the particular circumstances to which the, Order. To which the Order. Um, <coughs> member relates. The, the, questions the member for Mayo will cease interjecting. In relation to the higher education contribution scheme, the scheme which is now in operation, questions of refunds or exemptions are matters for the secretary of my department. In relation to the higher education um, administration charge, my recollection is, and you've got to recall that this scheme no longer operates, and 1988 was the last year of its operation, but my recollection is that matters relating to um, giving exemptions or, or refunds were matters for the, institution, the institutions themselves and not matters which were referred to the government. But um, if the member wants to uh, raise this matter with me, uh, I'd be happy to look into it. The Honourable Member for Lilly. Mr Speaker, I direct my question to the Minister for Employment, Education and Training. Having noted the massive increase in the year 12 retention rate in Australian schools for some seven years now, I would ask the Minister to report on the reasons for this phenomenon. The Honourable Minister. Mr Speaker, I thank the uh, Honourable Member for her question. She would be well aware, as, uh, of, as uh, the uh, chairperson of the caucus committee, which examines these matters of employment, education and training of the spectacular improvements in retention rates in Australia since 1983. It's a matter which I've referred to before. It's a matter which the Prime Minister has referred to as well. And what we now know is that we have uh, achieved a figure of 61% in, in, in relation to uh, this year in terms of retention to uh, year 12. The major reasons for these, I think, uh, relate to the fact that more young Australians are keen to remain in the schooling system, recognising that it gives them the best opportunity to get the best kind of employment once they have left school and also to uh, equip them to fully participate in society as a whole. But I think it's also worth looking at the particular contribution that the Commonwealth has made over the last few years to the support of uh, schools and to the support of school students. If we look at the funding for, government, uh, for the funding of schools, for all school programs, we find that in 1990 there will, be, will have been a 15.5 per cent increase, real increase, in terms of what was provided before we came to office. In relation to government schools, the, gr the grants will be 26 per cent higher, and in relation to non-government schools, they are estimated to be 44.8 per cent higher 
in real terms. So that's uh, a very clear evidence of the additional funds that we are now providing to support schools, both government and non-government schools, uh, in terms of trying to provide higher quality education for a larger number of Australian students. As well, there has been the major overhaul and expansion of Ausstudy, where we now find that the number of people receiving, the number of students receiving Ausstudy has doubled between 1983 and 1989. And that, of course, has come at a very, at a very uh, great cost, where the cost of Ausstudy in total has gone up from $268 million to $774 million, a massive uh, increased investment in young Australians in terms of their, in terms of their future. We're, there has also been not just an increase in the number of uh, the money going to non-government schools. As a result of the new schools policy, which came in in 1986, we find that there have been 189 new non-government schools established, 118 schools have been extended, and 103 have had uh, Re reallocations or sorry relocations approved by the new schools uh, committee and if we are to just examine the cost of these new schools operating at their maximum enrollment that represents an increased cost of 81 million dollars in terms of federal contributions to non-government schools and this uh, is of course because or well, this is all part of the, the context in which this government has been able to support all schools. We've been able to settle the otherwise divisive state aid debate. We've provided uh, security and certainty in terms of the funding for the non-government uh, school system, and uh, that is a policy which we intend to support uh, into the future. Essentially, uh, Mr. Speaker, the Commonwealth is uh, concerned about equity, is concerned to provide a quality of opportunity for all Australian kids, regardless of whether they go to government or non-government schools. We want to see more and more of them completing the full 12 years of, uh, of schooling and then as many of them continuing in some form of post-secondary education and training. This is not only good for the young people themselves in terms of uh, providing a better future for them, but it's certainly very much in the interests of the country as we need to have more modern skills and a higher uh, and a greater degree of skills generally as we confront uh, the changes going on in our economy which of course will continue into the future. The honourable member for Parks. Thank you Mr Speaker. My question without notice is to the Prime Minister. In view of the evidence before the Winchester coronial inquiry, I ask the Prime Minister, can he give the people of an Australia an unequivocal assurance that he has never participated in gambling or other illegal activities at the former Pine Lodge or any other casino or gambling joint in Canberra. The Honourable uh, Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, uh, I uh, treat that question with the uh, total contempt that it deserves. And uh, I, I merely make the observation, uh, Mr Speaker, that uh, these matters are uh, before the courts. The uh, source of the allegations, uh, I should think, would, uh, would of its order. Mr Speaker, I would have thought that the source of the allegation is sufficient uh, of itself to uh, answer, the, uh, answer the question, but uh, for what... Oh, just... Order! Wait your miserable little turns, will you? Oh. And, uh, Mr Speaker... Uh, Mr Speaker, if it's a matter of any interest uh, uh, to those opposite, and if it is, it's a reflection upon them, uh, I can uh, give the assurance that's uh, requested. The Honourable Member for Brisbane. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, I address my question without notice for the Minister for Defence. <coughs> and I ask, uh, can the Minister advise the House what support the RAAF provided to the Australian public during Operation Immune? What was the cost of that support, and will those costs be recovered? The Honourable Minister for Defence. I thank the Honourable Member for his question. Of course, since uh, this Parliament last met between the uh, beginning of December and now, the uh, government, in consultation with the airlines, uh, determined that a sufficient level of service had been reached for uh, us to no longer need the very excellent service that had been provided by the RAAF and the RAN 
under Operation Immune. And therefore, the Prime Minister was able to farewell the last, uh, or welcome home, I should say, the last flight on December the 15th and uh, uh, preside over the sending of the pilots and air crew and maintenance people to a well-deserved Christmas holiday. I think I can speak uh, on behalf of all the government in thanking the RAAF and the RAN for the excellent services they provided over those several months when they were in operation. Some 224,000 uh, seats were provided uh, on its highest day, 3,071. The RAAF and RAN carried 175,000 passengers. They serviced 17 locations, in particular maintaining air links between Tasmania and the mainland. Up to 300 RAAF and 32 Navy air crew were involved and over 600 maintenance personnel. The squadrons concerned were 32nd, 33rd, 36th and 37th. The maintenance squadrons at East Sale and 486 RAF Richmond, that's the 32, 33, 36 and 37 RAAF, and uh, the RAN HC723 squadron, and a very effective service they provided uh, for our people in that period of time. In recognition of the public service the ADF was providing, the government decided that the airlines would not be charged any of the ADF's fixed costs, such as salaries, capital depreciation and overheads. The marginal costs of spares and contractor maintenance were largely dependent upon the hours flown by the aircraft involved. For this reason, actual marginal costs could not be determined with any precision until the end of the ADF assistance when hours flown were known. The difference between the ADF's actual marginal costs and cost recoveries from the airlines amount to $816,000, $884. Defence will be seeking supplementation for this amount in the 1989-90 additional estimates review. So I think one can see from those statistics that, in fact, very close to the uh, cost of the operations of the aircraft were, in fact, uh, obtained uh, via the payments made by the airlines to the RAAF. And that additional amount, as I said, and as I foreshadowed in this House, when we knew the actual costs of the operation at the conclusion of the operation, uh, we would be putting that to government, and that, of course, will be raised, uh, raised uh, with, them, uh, with government next year. I might say that, by and large, the activities of the RAAF have been, and the RAN have been welcomed in our community and well supported by our community. They have uh, provided, been provided with an opportunity to show what all of us who are involved with the Defence Forces one way and another have known for a very long time, and that is the Defence Forces of this country provide a dedicated service to this country and uh, can be relied upon in all circumstances where assistance is required to provide that assistance. I was uh, pleased to note uh, that uh, a number of members of the opposition were able to find themselves it in themselves to themselves congratulate the RAAF in the final analysis <laughs> after the conclusion of those flights on the work that they had done. But uh, one can't help commenting on one or two of these particular comments that uh, an element of hypocrisy can be foreseen can be seen in what was said. The leader of the National Party, for example issued those words of uh, thanks to the RAAF when uh, those flights concluded. Only a few weeks previously, he was joining his uh, late and totally unlamented Premier of, uh, then Premier of Queensland in taking on the RAF for allegedly unsafe op operations and calling into question in detail their professionalism. That is a stand that nobody on this side of the House could uh, agree with. And if the statement of the leader of the National Party represents in some shape or form a mea culpa for his efforts in that regard, uh, we, can, uh, we can only welcome that. But they have uh, covered themselves, I think, with, uh, uh, with a, uh, a degree of public regard over the last few months that should stand our armed services in good stead for a very long time. Our people know, now know of the professionalism of our armed services and their capabilities. And we do, uh, on this side of the House, all thank them very much for the tasks they've performed. The Honourable Member for Mayo. Uh, Mr Speaker, I direct my question to the Prime Minister. I refer the Prime Minister to the fact that businessman Mr Eddie Kornhauser has been charged with the paying of bribes in Queensland to obtain assistance in getting official approval Order. for Order. the Paradise Centre development at Surfers Paradise. 
Will the Prime Minister outline to the Parliament the detail of any direct or indirect financial or in-kind assistance he has received from Mr Eddie Kornhauser since he became a member of Parliament? Order. The, quest the question is out of order. It doesn't come within the purview of the Prime Minister's portfolio. The Honourable Member for Kingston. And, uh, is also to the Prime Minister on a much more serious subject. And uh, I preface it by saying that people on both sides of this House. Order! Order! I preface it by Kingston. saying that people on both sides of this House would have uh, welcomed the initiative the government has taken to bring an end to the bloodshed in Cambodia and to bring about peace in that uh, troubled country. Uh, I ask the Prime Minister what reactions has the government received in discussions with other countries to our proposals for a UN interim administration in Cambodia? The Honourable the Prime Minister. I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his uh, question, Mr Speaker. Um, a Deputy Secretary in the Department of uh, Foreign Affairs and Trade, Mr Michael Costello, has discussed our proposals uh, in Hanoi, Beijing, Phnom Penh, uh, with Prince Sihanouk, uh, and uh, with other interested parties in Bangkok, and he will discuss them uh, tomorrow in Jakarta. Now, of course, Mr Speaker, this is not the time for me to give the House a detailed account of uh, Mr Costello's discussions. Honourable members, I believe, will understand the uh, sensitivities uh, involved in exploratory discussions of this sort. The government will also want to take stock of the situation after Mr, Co uh, Mr. Costello returns and give us a, gives us a detailed <coughs> report on the weekend. But I can say at this stage to the honourable member that uh, we have been very encouraged indeed by the interest that has been shown in our proposal by all the parties principal uh, to the dispute and of course also by all those outside countries who have been involved over a period of time in a search for a settlement to the tragic situation in Cambodia. This interest that has been shown, Mr Speaker, is uh, sufficient certainly to encourage us to proceed with further consultations, and I would expect Australian ministers and officials to continue these discussions in the new year. As the government has said before, of course, Mr Speaker, we don't pretend to have all the answers on a Cambodian settlement. It would be absurd to make any such suggestion. We certainly don't uh, expect a solution to this uh, so far intractable conflict to be easily or quickly achieved. But I think we are in a position to say, Mr Speaker, that the government's latest initiative Order. has the, the opened up of the uh, important... The uh, I can say, Mr Speaker, that the government's latest initiative has uh, opened up important new avenues for negotiations, and as I've said, we will uh, continue to pursue them. I can assure the honourable gentleman who asked this question, who we all know has a particular interest in these affairs, but I also assure all honourable members that we will continue with these discussions for as long as they seem useful uh, to try and find a workable end to the suffering which I think all Australians agree the uh, Cambodian people have already endured for far too long. The Honourable Member for Goldstein. Uh, Mr Speaker, my question is also to the Prime Minister. I ask the Prime Minister, given the fact that he has now publicly stated in the age on the 9th of December that there was, quote, no adverse recommendation, unquote, by the Foreign Investment Review Board against the Herald and Weekly Times takeover by News Limited, will he release the Foreign Investment Review Board's reasons as to why a foreign citizen owning 70 per cent of the print media was not contrary to the national interest, and if not, why not? The Honourable well, Prime Minister. It would be a good idea if the Honourable Member for Goldstein got his portfolio is right. The Foreign Investment Review Board comes under the uh, under the uh, portfolio responsibility of the Treasurer, and I think the question should be addressed to him. But as uh, as uh, far as I'm con Order. As, far, as far as I'm concerned, uh, the decision that has been taken in uh, this regard is acceptable and will stand. The honourable member for Chifley. My question is directed to the Minister for Social Security. Is the minister aware of claims based on a paper by uh, Rob Dimplesman of the Parliamentary Library that living standards in Australia have fallen since 1983? Uh, can he advise the House whether these claims are accurate? And if not, what is the true position? The honourable minister for Social Security. <coughs> oh, uh, Mr. Speaker, I thank uh, the honourable member for his question. Uh, I am uh, aware, uh, Mr. Speaker, of claims made by the member for Wentworth uh, based on the paper referred to. 
It is, uh, I guess, uh, a paper that uh, the honourable member for Wentworth uh, might come to grips with. To quote the paper itself, uh, it is a narrow economistic perspective. Living standards are defined here in terms of income. It is a narrow, I'm quoting from the paper, it is a narrow economic economistic perspective and does not purport to represent welfare or quality of life. And that's uh, what the paper itself says. Again, it says data shown here exclude the value of government provided services, the social wage. Mr. Speaker, uh, it is uh, important uh, when seeking to analyse a question like uh, the quality of life or living standards that one does take uh, a broader perspective. One doesn't simply look uh, as the paper does to uh, particular uh, budgets and results of budgets. For example, uh, the April statement this year, which uh, showed uh, a remarkable uh, improvement in terms of living standards as a result of tax cuts uh, and wages, or that it simply look, as the paper does, at particular types of families, such as the model family of a male breadwinner with a dependent spouse and two dependent children which represents uh, only a small percentage, about 9 per cent of Australian families. So that uh, we have no argument, uh, Mr Speaker, with the paper in the sense that uh, uh, its writer suggests uh, the need to look more broadly uh, than uh, simply at uh, such a narrow economistic perspective. I would uh, suggest, uh, Mr Speaker, that while uh, the honourable member is uh, making statements and assertions in this particular area. He might go, for example, to the work of uh, Bradbury, Doyle and Whiteford of the Social Policy or Social Welfare Research Centre at the University of New South Wales. They point out, Mr Speaker, that real household disposable income per capita has risen since 1983. They point out that the median income of all families have risen about 5 per cent in real terms over that time. They point out also the very marked improvement in incomes of sole parents and low-income families and farming families under labour. They point out that if you allow for higher labour force participation rates for women, the real increase in medium income for families is of the order of 6.5 per cent. The government, uh, Mr Speaker, has to deal with the difficulties of real families working hard to bring up their children. That's why, Mr Speaker, we have delivered the largest increase in family allowances in this country's history. It's why we've implemented, Mr Speaker, the Family Allowance Supplement, providing increases in real disposable income for the lowest uh, quartiles in terms of the Australian income—50, 75 per cent uh, of uh, around 20 per cent real in terms of gains. It's why we've indexed uh, the Family Allowance the dependent spouse rebate and the sole parent re rebate and entrenched our benchmarks for the family allowance supplement. Mr. Speaker, uh, in terms of uh, social reform, one will look to this period as a period in which the social wage has never played a more important role in terms of the maintenance of real living standards. And of course, the indexation of those uh, various payments and tax uh, allowances is a crucial element in those reform, which is one of the reasons why, Mr Speaker, uh, one finds the opposition and indeed certainly the member for Wentworth and Senator Stone very silent on indexation of family allowances. Mr Speaker, I just uh, mention uh, by way of passing and in conclusion that uh, Australian families, understanding Labor's commitment, uh, recognise the importance of these payments, and I would simply mention to those listening to this broadcast it's important that review forms be returned as soon as possible. Oh, Thank you. The Honourable Member for Goldstein. Treasurer, in view of the answer the Prime Minister just gave, I ask, as the Prime Minister has asserted that the advice from the Foreign Investment Review Board was that there were no reasons why the takeover of the Herald and Weekly Times by News Corporation should not proceed, will he now release to the public, which is so obviously and vitally affected by the takeover, the advice that was in fact given to the government by the FIRB? The Honourable the Treasurer. Uh, the answer is no, Mr Speaker. Uh, the uh, Order. Advi advice to the government on all of these many takeovers affect the public, obviously, and advice to the government is the government's advice. But I notice that the Honourable Member for Goldstein has been beating a drum about this matter now for, has, for the time that has elapsed since uh, 
News Limited took over the bulk of the Herald and Weekly Times newspapers. And we now have this constant parroting of this statistic that News Limited has 58%, I think from memory, or 56, of the uh, print media, print interests of this country. But we never heard from the Honourable Gentleman when he was a minister or since the statistic in relation to the Herald and Weekly Times group when it held 52% or 54% from memory of the media in this country, of the print media. So 54% in the hands of the Herald and Weekly Times was of course not even worthy of mention. But 56 or 58 in the hands of Murdoch is a national tragedy. And of course, plus, yes, plus I was coming to that, plus TV. And of course, in those days, the Herald and Weekly Times had HSV7 in Melbourne and uh, another television station, I think it was in Brisbane, but my memory may not serve me, in Adelaide, plus a group of, uh, uh, plus a group of um, country radio stations and a stack of provincial newspapers, naturally, with the capital city press. Now, in terms of national, national concentration, and we've heard much about that, there is not now a print owner who owns any television. Television is divorced entirely from print, and both are divorced from radio. But that was not the case when the Herald and Weekly Times held the show for all of those years, when, of course, the Liberal Party was the very happy and quiet recipient of the joy coming from the Herald and Weekly Times in Melbourne. And it only became an issue when Rupert Murdoch had the temerity in what was basically a transfer of assets from one company to another to buy it, but in doing so shed the television interests which were held by that group. And since then we've had all of these uh, uh, people with uh, so much umbrage about the state of the media. I mean, the one that brings, I mean, apart from the Honourable Member for Goldstein, who did nothing about it, about the concentrations when he was a minister and was silent about it, uh, I, if I might interpose, the one that really makes me giggle is the former editor of the Sydney Morning Herald, David Bowman, who's now talking about plurality of the media and a sensible and balanced media when he was the dreariest, most conservative right wing editor in the country when he ran the Sydney Morning Herald, I might add, into the ground in those years. And all of a sudden, this conservative, this conservative, boorish, right-winger, ideologue, decides he's now some sort of media libertarian, <laughs> uh, arguing for a free and, and moderate and plural press. I mean, what a joke. That's all right for people that don't have any memory. And I used to, in those days, run the New South Wales Labor Party. And I used to just occasionally talk to Dr. Bo Mr. Bowman about, about, uh, about uh, the state of the Sydney Morning Herald, and I, and I wouldn't bother you with the replies. <laughs> so, and yet we've been joined. I mean, all the, all the media do-gooders, Bowman, uh, the, uh, yeah, well, I, I wasn't even going to bother with Tui, but uh, uh, the, uh, he's, of course, the principal advisor of the member for Goldstein, <laughs> and the member for Goldstein, who uh, who was uh, well, mate, one Order. of your members has been quite happy to be run by him for years. The member for Goldstein, so I wouldn't be too cocky about that if I were you. And here's the member, here's the member for Goldstein, uh, here's the member for Goldstein now saying that the government, by implication, has sort of you know slipped the Herald and Weekly Times to Rupert Murdoch, and why can't all this documentation be made? public. The fact of the matter is, in this country, we now have a diversity of media ownership, which we never had when the coalition ran. No, you, you laugh, but you were quite happy, you were quite happy with, the old, with the old Frank Packer rags, Henderson rules, put together by Menzies, the fiction that two television stations, two television stations, Sydney and Melbourne were the same as Mount Isa and Broken Hill. That was the fiction you put together. Two television stations, you can own two TV stations, and so you had Frank Packer sitting up with Sydney and Melbourne, and, uh, and Rags Henderson sitting up with uh, Melbourne and Brisbane, and that was the same as Broken Hill and Mount Isa. Now that was media equity in your terms, in media equity in your terms. Now we've got, now we've got 
television divorce from the print and print divorce from radio and radio divorce from television. And you've all got the hide to say. But as well as that, in the 54 per cent which used to be in the Herald and Weekly Times, it also the member had, from cease it it also had it also had it also had the West Australian, another capital city newspaper. That is now removed from the Herald and Weekly Times. It's in the hands of Bond Media. It's not in the hands of Rupert Murdoch. So the fact is that the 50 odd percent you're talking about has an entirely different character because it's now not covering one state. And given the fact that the, that the West Australian is an important newspaper, particularly in the state of Western Australia, and Western Australia happens to be one of the Australian states, or haven't you noticed? The fact of the matter is that the character of the 50 odd percent in the hands of the Murdoch group is nothing like the character it was in the hands of the Herald of Weekly Times. I mean, the fact of the matter is, Mr. Speaker, the Liberal Party had this nice thing going for them for a couple of decades. But in the end, uh, the, the, uh, the Conservatives who ran the Herald of Weekly Times ran it into the ground like you ran Australia into the ground. And the public changed you as the equity owners, the Herald and Weekly Times changed them. The Honourable Member for Canning. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My uh, question, without notice, is directed to the Minister for Social Security. Is the Minister aware of proposals, proposals to abolish the capital gains tax at a cost of $450 million? If that were to be implemented without damage to fiscal policy, what would need to be done in cutting social programs? The Honourable Minister for Social Security. <coughs> Order. Mr Order. Uh, Speaker, the uh, figure that uh, the honourable member gives is uh, equivalent to what the opposition uh, uh, costs its own proposal. Of course, those costs would increase for many years after that because of ret the retrospective gift to the wealthy. You could pay for this gift to the wealthiest, of course, in a range of ways. Well, the honourable member laughs. But the fact of the matter is that finding $450 million is no easy business. And finding $450 million in terms of the social security portfolio would mean making some politically pretty tough decisions. I mean, if you come up front and you say we want to find $450 million off the capital gains tax, we want to take $450 million and look after our friends. And we're going to uh, find that $450 million out of the Social Security portfolio. Very simple. Well, of course, you could look first of all, and I suppose the easiest uh, place to look would be, would be the question of indexation itself. Because the cost of indexation, I'm not talking just about the age pension, but the cost of indexation overall is something of the order of $1,300 million a year. And the cost of indexation of age pensions would exceed uh, $450 million. And uh, in terms of, well, you've done it before, you're in government, and uh, uh, you know, that was no concern. You suspended indexation for a year. And you could suspend it again, and at least for that year, you would save $450 million. But of course, that's not the only way you could save it. And uh, let me just refer to some of the other areas that one could look at. You could, for example, uh, dismember income support for people with disabilities. You could look at abolishing the sheltered employment allowance, the rehabilitation allowance, mobility allowance and the child disability allowance. And if that uh, didn't give you enough uh, savings, you could throw in as well the uh, double orphans pension and abolition of income support for people under the age of 18. So that uh, by that kind of uh, clustering of savings, of course, it is possible uh, to achieve uh, very significant uh, savings indeed. We've heard uh, from the opposition from time to time concern about uh, what might be saved in relation to sole parent pensions. And of course, uh, for those uh, uh, widows over the age of 50 who were saved uh, when we moved uh, to a different uh, situation with a qualifying age of 16, then there are significant. Uh, there are significant uh, savings there. Indeed, if one were simply uh, trying to look after the $17 million that's to be uh, directed the way of John Elliott, then uh, by denying over 4,000 widows any income at all, one could simply uh, fix up John Elliott alone. 
or one can deny 20,000 young Australians order, any income order, support. Order. The minister might resume his seat. The member for O'Connor on a point of order. Mr Speaker, I refer you to section 144 of your standing orders and the reference to the fact that questions must not seek or contain hypothetical matter. The matters to which this minister is now treating in a hypothetical matter are all written down in the opposition's order. economic action order. plan. There, there, it is not for order. you. There is he, no he, point of order. The they are covered, sir, in, in, already, and he will is being. Well, on a further point of order, sir, point of order. I remind you of your responsibility to keep the standing orders going, and this minister the is abusing the order. standing orders. The member for O'Connor will resume he is, his seat. He is treating the, the member. For, I warn the member for O'Connor. The Honourable Minister. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, uh, there's nothing. Order. There's nothing hypothetical about uh, savings of $450 million. It goes to people, and I've simply referred to some of the people that you can withdraw money from, because you don't go out there and save half a billion dollars without touching people. And if you're not going to knock off your 4,000 uh, widows, then you could go to say 20,000 16 and 17-year-olds. Look, no one believes that particular. Uh, that, that uh, particular document. No one believes that. Not even, not even the member for Wentworth, because the member for Wentworth made it very clear that he would make those savings work, and he would make those savings work. Uh, I would argue, Mr. Speaker, by going to uh, some of the issues that I've gone to. Or you could, uh, Mr. Speaker, you could withdraw. You, you could withdraw, Mr. Speaker. Uh, 20,000 Australian families their allowance for their children with disabilities, again to find that savings of the order of $17 million, equivalent to the savings that uh, are in fact being paid or would be paid to John Elliott by removal of the capital gains tax. Mr Speaker, no, well, look, uh, look, uh, order. Order. There is far too much noise. It's interesting. Uh, Members on my left will cease interjecting. The Leader of the Opposition will cease interjecting. The Honourable Minister. Well, it's interesting, uh, Mr Speaker, that, uh, that uh, members of the Opposition should regard it as a waste of time to talk about savings. After all, uh, the Honourable Member for Wentworth indicated that uh, the uh, savings that uh, he thought he might be able to make through the Economic Action Plan, so-called, uh, were only the beginning only the beginning of savings that would flow uh, from the economic policies of the opposition. Now, the fact of the matter is that to save $450 million requires questioning, laying open to question the security of the uh, millions of people who, are one way or another, are dependent on the social security system. And so you can't avoid, Order. You cannot avoid Mr Speaker, the question of uh, indexation, and that's why whenever the question of indexation is raised, you get three or four different answers uh, from the opposition. Senator Cheney, only the other day in the Senate, Mr Speaker, uh, made it clear that his position on indexation was right across the board, absolutely rock solid, even given uh, commitments made by the government that were not legislated. A very different position that, uh, than that put forward by the honourable member for Wentworth. Mr. Speaker, the reason that uh, the opposition are not uh, uh, are obfuscating, who are not prepared to uh, to come out and indicate where these savings are, is that those savings affect uh, people and sensitive interest groups. The honourable member for Fadden, order. Mr Speaker, my question is directed to the Minister for Transport and Communications. Has Australian Airlines now hired contract crew enough to man their entire Airbus A300 fleet? Have the pilots been hired from Japan Air Services, formerly Toa Domestic Airlines of Japan? Have official protests been received from Japan Air Services at this action or from the Japanese aviation officials at this action? The Honourable Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I understand that uh, Australian Airlines now does have a full complement of Airbus crew and that uh, some of those uh, cr crew were, were obtained uh, from Japan. I understand that the nationality of the pilots involved is American rather than Japanese. As uh, regards to any official protests having been lodged about that, I'm not, I'm not aware of them. The Honourable Member for Port Adelaide. Mr Speaker, my question 
is to the Minister for Community Services and Health. I draw the Minister's attention to a statement by the Leader of the Opposition on the 7.30 report on the 14th of December, where he blamed the government— Order. Order. The member for Morton on a point of order. Any statement by a member of this side of the House is not a matter for a minister of that the side of that chamber to be responsible order, for order, in we have, with standing We orders. will hear the question and then I will decide well, whether it's in order. Where the Leader of the Opposition blamed the government for the ongoing delay in the release of the Opposition's seventh health policy <laughs> and stated that we're having great difficulty extracting the costing from the government and to get the costings right we need their costings, and they're not making them available at the moment, so I'll certainly hope we'll be able to. And I'll hope you'll have the government's costings too. Can the minister advise the House as to whether the government regularly publishes the real costs of the Medicare program? The Honourable Minister. <laughs> Mr Speaker, I thank the uh, Honourable Order. Order. I... The member for Morton, by way of interjection there, attempted to suggest that by allowing members to have a preamble on their question, then I should start to rule those preambles out of order. I'd be quite happy to adopt that proposal. It would mean, however, that most of the questions that are asked would be out of order. And I think that the House has accepted that the House would prefer that members provide ministers with some information on which ministers can answer the questions to them. So we won't have any more of those interjections from the member for Morton. The Honourable Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for Port Adelaide for his question. And yes, uh, I uh, have had drawn to my attention the rather extraordinary statement by the Leader of the Opposition uh, about this problem of costings. It does seem to me the latest in a long series of excuses as to why this now, I suppose, the most awaited health policy in this country's history uh, is still not uh, before us. Uh, in answer to the member for Port Adelaide, let me point out that uh, those figures as relates to the government costings uh, appear in the budget papers, they appear in my department's explanatory notes, they appear in the departmental annual report and the Health Insurance Commission annual report, so that uh, if you put all of those documents together, it does require a little work, but if you put all of those documents together, you can be very clear indeed about the costing of the government's Medicare program. Indeed, it is uh, extraordinarily open. But not only have they that resource, because uh, quite constantly, departmental and HIC officers appear regularly before the Senate Estimates Committees, and where they've answered regularly questions about the costing of the Medicare program. Uh, it does seem to me that, uh, despite the uh, opposition leaders claim that the government's refusal to assist with costings is delaying his scheme somewhat, they've certainly never approached us for any costings, and I must say we'd be extremely willing to comply. But uh, I know that uh, the Leader of the Opposition's statement, as usual, is open to several interpretations, but certainly I can say that uh, nobody from the opposition side has approached the government uh, to help in relation to costings. Uh, we, of course, would be very prepared to help them. It's clear they need help and uh, we would be uh, quite eager uh, to supply it. So when all that's put together, all one can say is either the statement of the Leader of the Opposition uh, means that he hasn't read the budget and hasn't read those papers, or he's providing just simply another excuse for the non-release of this policy. Now, of course, the Opposition has had uh, five health shadow spokesman and six health policies already and uh, we have been waiting for this seventh health policy for some 18 months. Now we do have the good news that it's likely, likely to be released in February or March, though I've got to say, I've got to say that the member of Ta for Tangney, the shadow spokesman for health, does cast some doubt on that when he said on the 21st, and I quote him, he told the West Australian newspaper on November 21st, my own view is that it will be released before the next election campaign. <laughs> so, though we're given, the, though we're given this uh, promise of uh, <laughs> order, though we're given this uh, promise uh, for February or March, uh, there is in the statement for the shadow spokesman himself a remaining sense of uncertainty. Now, it is becoming very clear. To the Australian people that the real reason the uh, 
policy is not being released is that there is a significant division within the opposition ranks over the health policy. Between the economic rationalists who know, who know that you can't sell a soft policy and the wet shadow minister who wants that kind of policy. Uh, what we can say now... What, Order. I know that he, I know that the honourable shadow, I know the honourable shadow minister is supposed to be a dry, but uh, his performance on the pharmacy issue was described by one commentator as very wet indeed. So that he'd certainly, uh, he certainly moved over to that end <coughs> of the spectrum. Uh, the reason, of course, the basic reason, of course, this policy uh, has great problems in being released is that. It is obvious to the Australian public that uh, if you carry through the sorts of ideas that have been leaked by the Shadow Minister, then for lower and middle income earners you will pay more, even if it's possible, as it may well be possible, to reduce some of the costs to the better off. It's exactly the same policy that uh, we've had with the capital gains tax. It's got exactly the same uh, effects, uh, an opposite form of redistribution, that is easing the burden on some of the better off and increasing the burdens on the middle and uh, uh, less well-off in our community. Now, all I can say in response is that I am perfectly willing to provide all of those documents to the Leader of the Opposition and the Shadow Health Minister, and to facilitate that task, I'm even prepared to mark in red all the immediately relevant pieces. <laughs> the Honourable Prime Minister. Ask a further question to be placed in the last time. <coughs> the Honourable Minister for Employment, Education and Training. Uh, Mr Speaker, I just uh, wish to add to uh, an answer that uh, was asked of me by the Honourable Member for O'Connor. And I, I have um, the report of the monitoring committee uh, that looked at the administration of the HEAC arrangements. It was chaired by Hugh Hudson, who was then chairman of the uh, Commonwealth Tertiary Education Commission. And in relation to, I think the honourable member's question went to uh, the time at which payments should be made and the circumstances under which refunds should be made. I just uh, refer to a couple of extracts from the committee's report, and they say that deadlines for payment of the charge varied from institution to institution, ranging from late January to mid-May. 37 of the institutions which have replied to the commission's letter to date, that is at the date of publication of this report, said that payment of the charge was a precondition of formal enrolment. It then goes on to say that the legislation provides that each institution will determine the date by which a student shall be formally enrolled. This acknowledges the variation in enrolment dates and procedures in various institutions. It goes on to say in relation to refund arrangements, almost all institutions indicated that they had made provision for refunds, although under strict guidelines. Most would only refund if the student withdrew before the deadline for payment or commencement of the sem semester, while some stated that they would only refund the charge if the student accepted a place at another institution. So uh, it confirms, I think, uh, what I said, and that is that the matter of the payment, the particular arrangements for payment and the particular arrangements for refunds were matters for institutions. And when, when students approached me as minister uh, seeking a refund, I referred them back to their institution because that's where the matter lay. Now, the uh, honourable member referred to the circumstances of a particular student. Uh, I don't know of the circumstances of every student around Australia. And although the honourable member is an incorrigible busy busybody and loves to know the personal circumstances of everybody, I think the, the, uh, the, rela the relationship between a student and his or her university should be a matter of confidence between them. Order. Order. The, order. the member for O'Connor will withdraw that remark. What's that? Even if he got her a refund? The member for O'Connor will withdraw the remark. I'll read. I don't have. The, the member, I've called upon, I have called upon the member for O'Connor to withdraw that remark. Will the, the member for O'Connor withdraw the remark? I withdraw the remark. The member for O'Connor, resume his seat. I, have, I present the annual report by the Auditor-General of the Australian Audit Office for 1988-89. I also present the following audit reports of the Auditor-General for 
number 23, aggregate financial statements prepared by the Minister for Finance, number 24, the Department of Employment, Education and Training, number 26, the Department of Community Services and Health, and number 27, the Parliament House Construction Authority. The Honourable Minister.